Well, good morning everyone and welcome to worship here at Centenary. Uh, whether you're sitting with the family or whether you're worshipping with us from home, it's a joy to be sharing in worship with you. It's Advent, the third Sunday of Advent, so we have a few candles to light. You're going to have to be patient. So you'll remember that we have already lit the candle of hope, the candle of peace, and today we light the candle of joy. Hope, peace and joy, and do you know what the one is for next Sunday? love indeed and on Christmas Day we will light the Christ candle as well so as we gather Sisters and brothers, we acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are worshipping today, who for 60,000 years have cared lovingly and responsibly for this land that we now enjoy. Our call to worship. This is your day. And we shall This is your day. And we shall this is your day. So let us pray. Bless us as we meet together, dear Lord, we pray. Bless the singing of your praise, the reading of your word, the sharing of our fellowship, the prayers that will be offered. Bless us as we meet together, dear Lord, we pray. Amen. So, a good song for Advent we're going to join together in singing now, Make Way, Make Way for Christ the King.
Now we're going to join in prayers of confession and firstly you have the opportunity as we pray in silence to make your own peace with God. So let us pray. Holy God, you offer us new life in the baby at Bethlehem. But we confess that we have made something trivial, something sentimental out of Christmas. Your light comes into the world and we see only the pretty lights on trees. You shine in the darkness, but we turn away and miss you. Your word is made flesh but we would like something nicer, more spiritual than the humanity of God with us in the flesh. So we pray together, forgive us God, strengthen us with the hope that cannot be packed away with the Christmas ornaments. May we who have befilled this glory hold it in our hearts forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us share a sign of peace with one another. We're going to have uh, time with the children, which means all of us. Uh, if you'd like to come to the front, Lily. <laughs> you got a present for me? <laughs> That's good. Do you know what this is? Um, a drum. That's a drum. Yeah, well, some people would call it a tambour tambourine. Tambourine. You can beat it, which I'm going to get you to do in a minute, if you're willing to. But we're going to pretend it's a drum, because it's the only thing I could find, or that Craig could find for me. Um, and why have I got a drum, do you think? Why would I have a drum in church near Christmas? Little drummer boy, yes. Now, you all know that associated with the story of Christmas, there's another story about a little boy. And this little boy was the son of those who owned the inn, where Mary and Joseph came looking for a room. And of course, as you know, they finished up in the stable. And that's where the baby Jesus was born. And as we know, and we see it happening week by week with our nativity scene, firstly, shepherds came and they worshipped the baby Jesus. And then later on, wise men came and they worshipped the baby Jesus. And we don't know how many others once they heard the news, began to crowd into that stable to see the baby Jesus. But the story, and we know it's just a legend, but we'd like to think it was true, wouldn't we? We'd like to think it was true that this little boy who was the son of the owners of the inn had a drum which he loved to play. And he saw all these people coming to see Jesus and in his heart he longed that he might have something that he could give 
because he saw the wonderful gifts that other people were bringing. So what did he do? Do you know the story? He played his drum for Jesus. That's exactly right. So what gift did he give to the baby Jesus? He really gave him his heart because he loved his drum and he played it as a way of welcoming the baby Jesus and saying how glad he was that Jesus had been born. So we're going to remember that today. Would you like to hold that? Can you? That's it. So while we sing, as we're going to, Little Drummer Boy, you can play for us on the drum. Can you do that, Lily? Thank you very much. Charlie, we're going to lead as everyone stands to sing the Little Drummer Boy. Jeff is going to bring us our Bible readings. The first reading today from the Old Testament. Uh, is reading from Isaiah chapter 35 and verses 1 to 10. The return of the redeemed to Zion. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly. And rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it. The majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. 
Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, be strong, do not fear. Here is your God. He will come with vengeance, with terrible recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. For waters shall break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. The haunt of jackals shall become a swamp. The grass shall become reeds and rushes. A highway shall be there and it shall be called the holy way. The unclean shall not travel on it, but it shall be for God's people. No traveller, not even fools, shall go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come up upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. And a New Testament reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, and reading from verses 2 to 11. Messengers from John the Baptist. When John heard in prison uh, what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offence at me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to look at? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? Someone dressed in soft robes? Look, those who wear soft robes are in royal palaces. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, no one has arisen greater than John the Baptist. Yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. This is the word of the Lord. There was once a spider who lived in a cornfield. He liked his home and he planned to spend there, stay there for the rest of his life. One day, the spider caught a little bug in his web and just as the spider was about to eat him, the bug said, if you let me go, I will tell you something important that will save your life. The spider paused for a moment and listened because he was amused. You better get out of this cornfield, the little bug said. The harvest is coming. All the stalks will be knocked down and the corn will be gathered up and you will be killed by the giant machines if you stay here. The spider said, I don't believe in harvests and giant machines that knock down corn stalks. How can you prove this? The spider grinned and said to the little bug, I don't believe you. And the spider ate the bug for lunch. A few days later, the spider was laughing about the story that the little bug had told him. He thought to himself, a harvest? What a silly idea. I've lived here all my life and nothing has ever disturbed me. I've been here since these stalks were just a foot off the ground and I'll be here for the rest of my life because nothing is ever going to change in this field. Life is good and I have made it. The next day was a beautiful sunny day in the cornfield. The sky above was clear 
and there was no wind at all. That afternoon, as the spider was about to take a nap, he noticed some thick, dusty clouds moving toward him. He could hear the roar of a great engine. And he said to himself, I wonder what that could be. I wonder what that could be. The Gospel reading for today focuses our attention on the life and ministry of John the Baptist. Like the bug in the cornfield, John did his best to help people understand what the future held and to warn them about the consequences of their behaviour. Now John understood that he was a servant, a witness, proclaiming that God's promised salvation was imminent and that his ministry was to prepare the way for Jesus through whom that salvation would have reality and power. In our reading from the Gospel today, we have John, who has been put into prison by King Herod, sending some of his disciples to find Jesus and ask him, Are you the one who is to come, that is, the Messiah, or are we to wait for another? Now on the surface of things, this is really strange because it wasn't all that long before this that John was preaching and baptising and preparing the people to welcome Jesus and he said things like, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is more powerful than me. I am not worthy to untie his sandals and he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Why the change? What has happened that John now seems to be having doubts about who Jesus actually is? Many of you will remember Trevor Quant, the Uniting Church minister who attended worship here with us uh, in his retirement. Trevor died some years ago. In the final years of his life, he was completely blind. I went to see him on one occasion, and we had, because it was at this time of year, we had a conversation about this question. Why did John now have doubts? And we agreed that what we see happening with John is a very human response. A human response from someone who knows that his life is in danger and wants assurance that in Jesus, God's purpose is being fulfilled. I've sat with many people over the years who have been dying and they have had a similar question. They too, like John, needed the assurance of God's love. So when the disciples of John come to Jesus, his response is very simple. He says to them, and this is so important, he says, go and tell John what you see and hear. Go and tell John what you see and hear. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. Jesus knew that when John heard this, his hope would be restored, and he would know in his heart that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. John was in prison. He could not see for himself what Jesus was doing. But he needed to hear the witness of those who had seen. Seeing, as you know, is believing. Seeing is believing. And we're all familiar with this saying. It's been around a long time. Wikipedia suggests that the first recorded instance of these words occurred as long ago as 1639. 
Not quite sure how Wikipedia knows that, but it's a good illustration for this morning. Seeing is believing. One of the best known stories in the New Testament about seeing is believing concerns Thomas, one of the disciples of Jesus, who could not bring himself to believe that Jesus had risen from the dead and was alive once more. He said that he would only believe if he could actually see. If he could see Jesus and touch the wounds on Jesus' body left by the nails and the spear. But when Jesus appeared amongst the disciples, Thomas no longer doubted. He had no need to actually touch Jesus at that moment for Thomas, seeing was believing. I went searching during the week for some photos that are genuinely extraordinary. Now let's look at the first one. You can see that there's a house. Can you? Up on the top of that. And you tell me how that got built. You'd say, if someone told you, I saw a house on top of a 200 metre high cliff, rock, whatever you could call that, pillar of rock, you might say, ha oh, ha, I'd have to see that to believe it. Well, look at this one as well. Now, we all understand what it means to say that seeing is believing. And we all understand that not everything we see is necessarily real. But today, I want to ask you to reflect on the relationship between seeing is believing and the Christian concept of faith. It's really important for us to do this because faith says exactly the opposite. Faith says we do not have to see in order to believe. We do not have to see in order to believe. But even more than that, faith says that to believe is to see. That's what faith says. You and I in everyday life say seeing is believing and we're absolutely right. But faith says that to believe is to see. And this is what the Apostle Paul wrote in his letter to the Hebrews long ago. He wrote this beginning of chapter 11. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith is about believing even when we can't see. Sometimes we're conditioned by both our upbringing and our life experience in ways that creates boundaries around both our thinking and our behaviour. We can become trapped by our fear of change or resist strongly anything that might disturb our daily routine. But faith enables us to think about the world and our daily lives in a completely new and different way. Faith helps us to understand that God sets us free to embrace and celebrate a whole new way of being and living. Faith transforms our experience and our understanding. And we see that happening over and over and over again in the biblical story. When Jesus called them to follow him, Peter, James and John left the world they had known all their lives. A world limited to boats and nets and fish. That was their world. It always had been. They thought it always would be but they followed Jesus and set out on a great adventure that changed their lives forever. This same Peter, only a few years later, in the house of the Roman centurion Cornelius, had another amazing insight. 
He understood for the first time that the good news that had come in Jesus was not for Jews only, but for everyone who would hear and believe. And we could go back to that moment in the house of Cornelius and say, that was the point at which the course of human history took a whole new direction. The gospel, Peter and the other disciples finally understood, was not for Jews only, but for the whole wide world. You and I are only here today because of that moment. Do you realise that? An extraordinary event happened when suddenly those who were to preach the gospel all around the world came to understand that God loved absolutely everybody. In the same way, the gospel also confronts us and challenges us. Sometimes, inevitably, we're conditioned by both our upbringing and our life experience in ways that create boundaries around both our thinking and our behaviour. In fact, it means our lives become quite limited and shut in. We are prisoners of the things we believe. We are not set free by them. We can become trapped by our fear of change or resist strongly anything that might disturb our daily routine or find ourselves unable or unwilling to say no to those who try to manipulate us. One of the realities I've encountered over the years is that some people are convinced that God works only in ways that they can affirm or with which they can identify. The inevitable conclusion is that anything with which they disagree is obviously completely inconsistent with God's will, as if they would know. And this can become a very easy way in which we ignore the challenges and demands of the gospel. I received a letter years ago from a church member, not from here, I'm pleased to say, who was very critical because prayers had been said during a church service he attended for the sufferers of AIDS. This will put this letter in history, point in history. Now this man could not understand why we should pray for those who, in his words, were in a situation of their own making. Now, of course, that's not only a gross generalisation, it totally misses the point. If God dealt with us on the basis of fault, we, every one of us, would be lost. But we live under grace. And when we intercede for others, we do so in the spirit and intention of grace which is not about blame, but seeking for healing and wholeness and the salvation of God in people's lives. When we're trapped within the limitations of our prejudices and misconceptions, we will never be able to see where and how God is at work in our midst. It is faith that opens our eyes to see what we've never been able to see before. It is faith that enables us to see a neighbour in every person we meet. It is faith that gives us the courage to embrace new opportunities and tackle new tasks that have always seemed too difficult or too daunting. It is faith that strengthens our resolve and keeps our hope alive when increasing age, I know all about it, means we can no longer physically achieve all that has been possible in the past. To believe is to see. And when we believe in Jesus, we see the God he came to make known to us. That is what John's Gospel means 
when it says of Jesus, the true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. And later, Jesus claimed that truth for himself when he declared, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I have a friend who sometimes talks about being in a dark space. That may be something with which you may feel some connection. Being in a dark space. The darkness in which people live and into which the light of Jesus shines is a complex and difficult thing because it's a metaphor for life experience and it can be experienced in many different ways. That darkness can be experienced through emotional and psychological and spiritual anguish. It can be experienced through grief or weariness or loneliness or broken dreams. It can be experienced through pain or confusion or uncertainty and fear. It can be experienced through not knowing or understanding the trauma inflicted on us by others through injustice or prejudice or gossip or judgment or rejection. When I was about 12 years old and living near Mount Gambia in South Australia, some friends and I were out exploring the countryside as we often did and we found a cave in the middle of a paddock. Now these caves were very common in the Mount Gambia area because of the prevalence of limestone which is so easily dissolved by water. I wasn't keen but my friends decided we would go down into the cave and explore it. From the very beginning I'm prepared to admit it, I was decidedly anxious. In fact, quite frightened. The further in we went, the more anxious I became. Eventually, we were in almost total darkness and had to feel our way along the passage that we were in. I decided I had had enough. I was genuinely frightened. So I turned and scrambled back up the way we had come as quickly as I could. The others, I discovered, were not far behind. They were obviously as worried as I was, but not willing to admit it. We were, after all, boys 12 years old. Soon we saw the light that marked the entrance and emerged into the sunshine as quickly as we could. What a relief. I've never forgotten that experience. And here is the good news that has come in Jesus. We do not have to live in the dark. We do not have to stumble about in that darkness, hoping somehow to find solutions to our problems or a reason to live. Why? The gospel challenges us to believe in order that we might see. That only happens by faith. And when we truly see by faith, life can never be the same again. And then we will really know and understand the joy the real joy of Christmas. Let's take a moment in silence to reflect upon the way in which God's word has spoken to us.
So now we sing together about the joy of Christmas. Joyful, joyful, we adore you. Now we bring our gifts to God. Let us pray. We pray together. We bring our gifts to you, Lord God, in gratitude and hope. In dedicating them, we dedicate ourselves again to be your people in the world, in the strength and enabling power of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Now, Jeff is going to bring us the notices and then Charlie will lead us in prayer. Our evening service uh, tonight at five o'clock is our uh, last evening service for the year uh, and uh, we will celebrate Holy Communion this evening. Also, uh, there's an opportunity, we hope, to have some live music this evening and so the invitation's gone out to, um, to anyone who wants to bring an instrument along. There'll be a practice from 3.45 and, uh, and then hopefully live music for our uh, evening service this evening. So if you're watching online and uh, you'd like to come along and participate in that, then uh, you'd be most welcome. Our evening service will recommence uh, on the 8th of January. Uh, there's um, envelopes for next year on the table at the, at the back of the church there, uh, just by the door. Uh, so if you use the envelope system for your weekly offering, uh, then uh, the weekly envelopes are available for you there. And this morning on the veranda, we have a table set up. Um, you'll find Christmas bowl envelopes out there for those who like to contribute to the Christmas bowl. Um, and also there's some gift catalogues uh, in support of the Everything in Common uh, program from uh, Uniting World. So Uniting World is the overseas um, mission agency of the Uniting Church. And uh, each year at this time, we have that opportunity to... Uh, to give gifts uh, to people uh, in many places across the world where they have few resources. Uh, so these are gifts that have the potential to transform the lives of those who need it most. Gifts like chickens and clean water and um, edu uh, gifts to provide education uh, for, for young people. So it's just that opportunity uh, we offer each year to support that program. Now there's various ways of doing that. There are the gift catalogues there themselves if, if you wish to have a copy of that uh, and uh, you can um, determine a gift that you might like to support and, uh, and fill in the details in the catalogue. Or there's some, just a list of the gifts out there that you can, uh, you can tick a box and contribute um, uh, with, with cash to, towards that gift and we can pass that on. Um, or uh, you can uh, do it online. So, and for those at home today, uh, the details that you'll find in Centenary Life, uh, you'll find a link to the website there for the Everything in Common gift catalogue. So various ways of contributing uh, to that program. Christmas services, next, uh, next Sunday morning we have a uh, carol service here, our annual Christmas carol service at 8.30 next Sunday morning. And uh, then a Christmas Eve service is on Saturday the 24th at 7pm and our service on Christmas Day, uh, Sunday the 25th at 8.30am. And just um, uh, again with regards to the distribution of our weekly email Centenary Life, uh, we did have a few problems over the last few weeks um, of uh, that going out to some addresses. Uh, particularly the Big Pond addresses. We think we overcame it last week, so uh, we, and I understand that most people on Big Pond that I spoke to did receive it, so uh, that is good to hear. Uh, but if you normally get Centenary Life and you haven't been receiving over the last few weeks, you still didn't receive it this, uh, this past week, then uh, please let me know. That applies to the prayer chain as well. Uh, if, you have, if you normally get that and didn't receive it, uh, then please let me know so that we can attend to that for you. Thank you. Ah, let us come together, let us pray. The joy of discovery, that moment when hope and expectation were gloriously met by the illumination of the one bright star. We cannot imagine what words were spoken or if first impressions left them confused. Messiah, Saviour, King, born in the barest of palaces, Yet they saw and fell down on their knees in adoration. Lord, they saw you and knew whom they had met. As we meet around the manger, the candle or the advent wreath, draw us into that stable in our imagination. In the quiet moments of prayer this Christmas, that brief oasis from the bustle of the world, bring to all of us the smell of the hay the sound of the animals, the cry of the baby. Draw us close to our Saviour, Messiah and King. 
as we bring not gold, frankincense or myrrh, but the gift of our lives, the only offering we can bring. May we show the Advent message in our lives, day by day, through he who came at Christmas. As we come into this Advent season, we are waiting to celebrate Christmas. Life involves a lot of waiting, waiting at the supermarket checkout, waiting for the traffic lights to change, waiting in traffic, waiting in a doctor's office, waiting for medical tests results, students waiting for exam results, Two years ago, the world was waiting for a vaccine to protect us from COVID. And now, once again, we are able, to, with some precautions, to travel again. At this time of year, we are especially reminded of waiting. Christmas involves a season of waiting, waiting for a saviour to come and free us from whatever is holding us back. Lord, we think of others who are waiting we pray for those who are sick, those in hospitals this Christmas season, waiting for operations, those waiting for test results or some procedures, and those waiting in hope for some cure for their illness, and for those who are the latest accidents victims of our streets and highways. We pray for those in nursing homes, those who are living alone, and who have no family, waiting for someone to visit them this Christmas. We pray for those grieving people who for the first time are facing a Christmas without a precious loved one at their side. We pray for the homeless who we can see every day in parts of Brisbane and surrounds, living in cars and tents, waiting for somewhere to call home. We pray for those who have fled their homes because of wars and persecution. Bring them safely to a place where they long to be. We pray for those who with joy adopt handicapped and foster unwanted children and all who happily care and minister to misfits and the more unlikely characters. For those who care for the demented with respect and all who carefully nurse those who, with misdeeds, who have been brought on on by their own folly. We receive our thanks and praise for those who through personal tragedy maintain a smile and those whose joy shines through their pain, through their grief, through their tears. We pray for our families, our neighbours, our brothers and sisters sitting beside us in the pews, and for those listening and watching in their homes. God of peace, of hope, of joy and love, we pray hope, hope for the hopeless, hope for the hopeful, hope for all people, hope for peace, hope for the future, hope for now. We pray peace, peace for our family, Peace for our neighbour, peace for the world, peace in our hearts, peace in our minds, peace in our lives. And we pray joy, joy for the young, joy for the old, joy for happiness, joy in work, joy in retirement, joy in everything. And we pray love. Love for friends, love for neighbours, love for strangers, love for our enemies, love for the lonely, love for the lost, love for those left out, love for the world, love for life, love for you. Amen. Let us pray the prayer the Lord gave us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Forgive us our sins. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.
You can't sit down for long, Charlie, because we're going to sing our final hymn. <laughs> Lord of all hopefulness, Lord of all joy. going to say the Mispah benediction to one another. Let's turn and face each other and share this blessing. May the Lord bless between me and thee whilst we are absent one from the other. So now people of God go out with the faith that will enable you to see where God is and how God is working in our world and in our lives. And as you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.